For the past week or so, I've been playing a ton of Skyrim on PS3. Back when the game was first released, I beat the main quest line, along with a handful of odd quests. But for some reason, I didn't touch the game beyond that. Strange, since I put several hundred hours into Oblivion, which has significantly less enjoyable combat and level design, but I decided to come back to Skyrim and try again with a new character, and with all of the DLC. I've actually been enjoying it quite a bit too. However, the game definitely still has loads of issues on consoles even to this day, and that got me thinking about post-release patches and how useful they can be. But more than that, it got me thinking about the controversial nature of day one patches. Some people see these as a sign of the times changing, while others see it as a developer's lazy way of fixing a broken game they just charged you money for. Some people even see all patches that way. I think this is an interesting conversation, and one that needs to be had. I can understand both sides, and I'm sort of in the middle. First, let's start with the basic history of patches. Patches aren't anything new in software. They've been around for a long time. In the early days, they were usually distributed in brand new versions of the program. Programming for widespread consumer software was still rather new, and the internet wasn't exactly readily available for patch distribution. So often, companies would just package their fixes and updates as a new version of the software. Now there's a common misconception that games back before the PS3 and 360 era didn't get patched. This isn't entirely untrue, but it's not the whole story either. First is the obvious. Games on PC had been getting patches for a long, long time by the time the 360 released. There were several ways to go about this that aren't that different from what we see today. One of the more interesting options was to include fixes and expansions rather than handing them out. Bethesda really liked to do this at the time, which is why tons of Oblivion glitches were fixed in Knights of the Nine and Shivering Isles. It's surprising that most people don't realize console games weren't without patches either. These patches obviously couldn't be distributed online, since two out of the three major platforms didn't have universal access to a hard drive for storage. There was simply no way to store fixes on an 8MB PS2 memory card or the GameCube equivalent. Heck, the GameCube arguably didn't even have online. And judging by the way they treated updates on the 360, I doubt Microsoft would have let anyone install patches on the original Xbox, despite each system having upwards of 8 gigs of space for storage. I could be wrong about that though, there might be a few exceptions. But regardless, the vast, vast majority of console games didn't get online updates before PS3 and 360. No, most console game patches in those days and before came through reprinting the game. Much of the time, these fixes were done in the greatest hits runs. Keep in mind, they also sometimes included new glitches as well. For a couple of examples, the greatest hits version of Dragon Ball Z Budokai 3 came with some extra costumes for characters, as well as a new glitch where Super Saiyan 4 Goku would freak out if he battled himself in a versus match. There are also some versions of Final Fantasy VII where it's possible to use Mime on your limit break even if your limit gauge currently is empty. Most versions of the game are the opposite and require at least a sliver of energy in the gauge. It wasn't the most common thing for a console game to get a patch at the time, but it wasn't uncommon either. All a game needed was another print run of any form and a publisher willing to let a team work on the fixes. Resident Evil 4 saw this through the PS2 version, where the GameCube version allowed Leon to purchase extra first aid sprays from every merchant, the merchant on the PS2 would only sell them if you didn't have any. The GameCube version also generally has easier enemy spawns, and a much more relaxed adaptive difficulty system. In other words, patching is nothing new, and is a great tool for fixing issues devs might have missed. There's no such thing as a bug-free game, so the ability to fix something after release, or change things that didn't really sit well with people is a powerful thing. It is true that, since patching was so much more difficult back in the day, there was a lot of extra work that went into making sure games worked as well as possible before they were released. But even still, they could often end up broken messes anyway. Limiting the developer's ability to fix their game after it's in the hands of the consumer doesn't by any means guarantee that it'll be a working product. Not every team had to make sure their game was finished before they released it, just like they don't now. The thing is, most games that are released are released in a finished state, or at least a state that's about as finished as we've always seen before patches became the norm. 
We forget how upwards of 30% of NES games and the like were not at all well designed, or were even unplayable messes sometimes. Unplayable messes that, without adjusting for inflation, still often cost more than what we're paying for games now. And even games that weren't broken sometimes were made incredibly unfair in order to pad length and make it seem like the game you bought was longer than it actually was. Just because a game came out before the PS3 and 360 era doesn't mean they couldn't have major issues. What about games like True Crime New York City, where the Xbox version is all but completely impossible to beat due to a bug during a late game boss? I can count at least three other games on my PS2 that freeze whenever I try to complete certain missions, despite the fact that they aren't scratched, have been tried on multiple consoles and with multiple discs. There are also games that seem to have some sort of memory leak that leads to the gameplay slowly melting until you can no longer play, like Midnight Club 3 Dub Edition Remix on PS2 for example. That's also a problem that the PS3 version of Skyrim has by the way, if you log in enough hours. Less skilled dev teams, overly demanding publishers, and the other countless factors that can lead to a broken game have always been a thing. These factors have always churned out less than stellar products. It's not necessarily anything brand new just because patches have become the norm. Now onto the opposite side of the spectrum. There are some devs that do indeed use patches as an excuse to rush and release unfinished games. The thing is, it shouldn't be up to the consumer to take the risk and spend $60 in the hope that they're buying the product that it says they're getting on the box. It's up to the developer to make that product right the first time. If you look at things like Assassin's Creed Unity, Battlefield 4, Project Cars, etc., they were all released in broken states that should have been considered unacceptable. People spent hard-earned money on those games, which were clearly unfinished. Some of the post-release patches came out and fixed some of the issues, but it was too late. Those teams then went on to fix many of the major outstanding issues and release a brand new game with these fixes implemented. Or in the case of Project Cars, they announced a sequel that will fix the issues. A crowdfunded sequel. Even though they have a publisher whose entire job it is to pay for the game. So, anyone who bought Unity, Battlefield 4, or Project Cars are now expected to pay another $60 to get an actually finished product. They hope. This problem does indeed exist, and it seems to be happening more and more. Other recent examples would also include the PC versions of Arkham Knight and Fallout 4. Publishers know how expensive development is getting. Some of them use this as an excuse to cut corners. It's a decision that satiates investors, but ruins customer loyalty in the long run. In reality, the fact that games can be patched later is all the more reason to spend development time and money wisely, rather than releasing things unfinished and bandaging them later. There's also the issue of promised or series staple features being advertised, but released later. Forge is obviously a core part of Halo by now, as is offline co-op. So it's strange that Forge wasn't there at launch for Halo 5, and the game didn't even include offline co-op at all. I'm by no means implying that these things are required for a Halo game to be good, or for it to be a real Halo game. But they're an important part of what makes Halo unique and shouldn't be taken lightly. Without them, it becomes significantly more mundane of a shooter. I personally think the issue with features like Forge coming post-release rather than at launch will fix itself eventually. While publishers and developers think it's a smart decision now, since it allows them to get their mountain range of work done without as much of a crunch near the end, and they can get games out faster, it also comes with issues. Publishers know that people lose interest in games fast these days. That's why major expansions, which used to be released over a year's worth of time or more, usually finish releasing in 8 months or less now. They even have other dev teams making the DLC sometimes, so the main team can focus on other things. They don't want people to lose interest before all of their DLC is released, right? So it only stands to reason that the same idea applies to free update content. If your game is barren in the beginning, with much of your content coming later, people will likely lose interest and sell your game to play something else before any of this free content even gets there. Then, the next time you make a game in that series, people will only remember how small and empty your game felt at release, since they never played the product it eventually became. 
I think devs and publishers will realize this, and eventually most will go back to making sure all major features are in their games at launch. Now, all of this comes back to the day one patch, which is a really dirty word within the gaming community today. I myself don't think it should be that way. It should be a word that we're wary of, for sure. It can be used for nefarious purposes, but it's also much less inherently evil than many people assume. These assumptions come from the idea that a development team works on a game basically until the week of release, where they then send it off to be manufactured, but this point in time pre-release is actually much more complex and much longer than people assume. From all of the sources that I've heard, most dev teams have around 8 weeks of free time before launch day. Free time is in air quotes, of course. After a game is finished, it's rated by the ESRB and whatever ratings board for each respective region, certified by distribution platforms, marketing ratchets up, it's manufactured, shipped, and played by review outlets for review. This takes quite a bit of time. Back before patches became the absolute norm, dev teams would use this time to work on DLC, take a small break, temps would be let go to sign on for other projects, and permanent employees would start on new projects themselves. But now, most teams work through all that time. They work on DLC still, but they also work on fixing new issues they've found or adding content. Just because a game has a day one patch doesn't automatically mean that it has major game breaking issues. I'd be willing to bet that the vast majority of day one patches are just there to fix very minor issues and polish things up. The development team has two full months to continue working on the game, remember? Why should they not continue polishing it and release a patch on day one? Simultaneously, why should they instead push back the launch of the game just to release the polished work on the disc? Polishing is never done, so the game would never release. In much less verbose terms, these patches aren't always fixing giant holes and issues. Most of the time, they're nothing but extra sheen designed to make your gameplay more enjoyable. Who, that has 8 weeks of downtime, should be criticized for using that time to fine tune their art. Now, from what I understand, it's much less common that developers add features to a game during this time. I'm sure it's happened before, but it's generally frowned upon, since adding one new feature can ruin literally everything. Balance, frame rate, quest design, it can create new bugs, I can go on and on. Usually, polish work in the last few months is mostly reserved for fine tuning of level design, quest design, sound design, and eliminating bugs that already exist within these systems. It's never a good idea to introduce new systems during this time, because then all of the testing has to be done over again. A lot of people will bring up games like Minecraft as an example for why constant patching and updating is always a good thing, but I think there's a very clear difference between a game like Minecraft, which has always been billed as an evolving experience, and a game like, say, Assassin's Creed Unity, which was billed as a finished product day one. Minecraft was designed and marketed in a way that allows Mojang to release gameplay mechanics and whatnot as they go. It was set up so that they were constantly designing new things and therefore constantly squashing bugs, like an MMO. People who bought it and buy it fully understand that they're beta testing new features to some extent, hence why Mojang always releases new snapshots for updates. That way, they can even get tons of people QA testing the additions for free. Ubisoft didn't do anything like that with Unity. They said they were making a game, said it would be finished the day you bought it, and expected you to pay full price for it. They marketed it as a full game, not a work in progress. As such, it's not really fair or relevant to compare them and say that Ubisoft or EA with Battlefield 4 or Activision with the new Tony Hawk should get the same expectations as Mojang does with Minecraft. If a game is billed as a finished product when you buy it, we as consumers definitely should see it as a finished product and judge it as such. It's not our job to limit their risk by paying for a product when there's no guarantee that it'll be finished. That's scamming people. Every copy sold is a chunk of money that they didn't lose on their investment, regardless of whether you enjoyed the game or not. So they use that as a way to limit risk and give them time to fix issues for the sequel, which you then have to pay for again. Like I said, I don't disagree at all that post-launch patches are a great tool. Even day one patches are usually entirely on the up and up, despite what everybody thinks. 
They don't at all deserve the terrible reputation that they've received over the years, but we simultaneously need to be careful not to allow ourselves to be scammed by those who don't have our best interests at heart. I'm looking at you, EA with Battlefront. What do you guys think? Are you okay with regular patches? Is it only okay if they're adding content that wasn't expected at launch, or if they're fixing minor bugs that are unavoidable? What about the infamous Day 1 patch? Comment below with your thoughts, and I'll see you all next time.